Hello, I'm Walt Bartman, and I'm the director of the Yellow Barn Studio at Glen Echo. And uh, we're doing a, a group of uh, interviews of our instructors uh, so that you will get to know who they are and perhaps maybe take a class uh, with them. Uh, I think that this is one of the ways to really get to know what they're about. And uh, if you have any questions and things like that, uh, you know, this, this uh, interview should answer quite a few of them. So with that, I'm going to introduce Dion Borchert, who uh, is uh, one of our instructors that teaches watercolor and teaches drawing. And I think uh, we, um, uh, you know, we're beginning our winter term. So uh, this is, uh, you know, a good opportunity for you to get to know Dion. And I want to welcome you, uh, Dion, uh, uh, here uh, and say hi. Hi, everyone. Um... I'm Bian Borchert, and I've been teaching um, for a while now at the Yellow Barn Studio, um, and I would say since 2012. Um, I've been teaching over all over a decade, um, and I love teaching, and I love being around students. Um, uh, I love communicating and giving them my art expertise, my knowledge. Um, I'm teaching for the upcoming winter classes. I'm teaching two classes, two morning classes and they start January 25th, um, beginning in intermediate watercolor, start on Monday mornings, that starts January 25th, and that's six classes. And um, on Friday mornings, I'm teaching drawing, also beginning in intermediate drawing. Um, so uh, I welcome you to try out and uh, get to know art and um, um, give these classes a try. Uh, it's fun to start with drawing and also watercolor is a very fun, translucent uh, medium that you can play around with and experiment with a lot of techniques. Um, so um, easy, I would say in a, sen in a sense, to kind of play with colors. Um, so. Um, yeah, this is great to have you. And, you know, uh, since I, uh, you know, be you've been teaching at the Yellow Barn, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of interest in your classes and, you know, uh, and really, truly we've had, uh, excellent uh, um, evaluations by students. I think Vion uh, is really someone to really start with and uh, and really get to, uh, uh, she'll get you to where you need to go with your work. So with that, I'm gonna give you, ask you a little question and that is, how did you start uh, with your art? Where did it start? Where'd you grow up? Things like that. Yeah. So basically for me, <laughs> art is genetic. In a way, I feel like I inherited kind of the whole art thing um, because I, um, my mom is an artist and everybody from my mother's side is an artist. So I grew up in an art household. Um, so for me, it felt like it's a very natural, almost genetic thing. Um, so ever since I can remember, I was drawing, making doodles and drawing, making comics, uh, making stories. And I've always loved art. Um, so in a way, growing up in a household where my mom's an artist, see her painting, uh, we hear about art, we talk about art, we go to art exhibits, art openings, art receptions, we hear art critics analyzing and talking about art. So for me, it was kind of like just a natural thing um, to become an artist. Um, it's almost like I didn't, I wasn't thinking, okay, should I become an artist or should, it was more of a natural thing. So that's kind of like, um, and I loved it. For me, being surrounded by art was kind of like nourishment for my soul. Um, so that's kind of my background. Uh, yes. You bring, that, you bring that to your students too, by the way. I mean, well, I, I hear the way they, they talk about uh -huh. their classes and about you and, you know, the, you're, an, you're an inspiration. So I think that's one of the things for sure. Uh, so where did you grow up and what, uh, what, what, where did you study and, and things like that? So basically, I was born in Beirut, Lebanon, and a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, but we didn't really live there because when I was born, it was kind of the beginning of the civil war, so very troublesome time. Um, so my parents moved to Amman, Jordan, which was peaceful, it still is peaceful. And I went to um, school there. Um, and basically, we moved to North Potomac, Maryland, uh, when I was 14. So I've been living in the States for a while now, uh, but I do go back and forth. I do travel a lot. 
Um, and I enjoy very much traveling. That's also part of my, um, the person that I am. I'm definitely international. So I've been to many countries. Uh, I lived in different countries and um, I love every country, the culture, every aspect of the heritage. Um, so I do think of myself as a very international person. Um, and so basically we came to, um, so I spent my high school, I finished my high school here in the States in North Potomac. And um, I even got a scholastic uh, art award when I was in high school. And um, I went to the Corcoran College of Art and Design, which is now Corcoran College of Art and Design, Wa George Washington University, um, part of that. And, um, and yeah, I've been, I've been living actually in Maryland ever since we moved. Uh, I do travel a lot nationally within the States. Uh, but um, we've, we, we, we like living in the DMV, in the DC area. Yeah, so what, what, if you were to describe yourself as, a, as an artist, what, how would you describe yourself? So I would describe myself, um, I would say I'm a painter um, because I really love painting. Uh, for me, it's kind of like, as I said uh, earlier, it's like nourishment. Like, I feel like I'm the hungry artist or the starving artist in the sense where I really love um, to paint. And I love the, the texture of painting, um, the thickness, let's say, of paint, uh, the quality of the paint. Uh, the, I like the tools. I like the brushes, uh, the different hairs uh, of the brushes, you know, um, and uh, different, as I said, tools. Uh, but I also like colors. I love colors. I'm the kind of artist who loves to have a lot of paint cubes, lots of different colors, um, and um, also a lot of different brushes. So I always kind of go to art stores. For me, it's like a candy store. Uh, so <laughs> I'm always, so I do love, I have a passion, I think I have to say. I have a passion for my profession, but I have a passion for painting. I do really love the process and also the creative aspect of painting. So with painting, I feel that, um, as I always say, my subconscious comes alive. Uh, so a lot of my, my imagination flies and there's room for that to flow. Uh, but I do think it, it kind of transcends us a little bit into the world of the subconscious. So I do think that's where creativity is very essential for everybody to kind of like tap into that part of who you are and discover it a bit to eventually discover your identity and who you are. So I do think um, a creative outlet um, is usually very good for people um, to let to get to know themselves even better in their journey of their life. Let's put it this way. Well, do you see yourself? Um, do you see yourself as an expressive painter? How do you? How do you? Definitely. View yeah, yeah. I consider myself as an expressionist. Um, nice. So the way I paint, I want to express emotions, to express feelings. Um, maybe express the, the ambiance, the atmospheric kind of sense of if it's a landscape, if it's a person, if it's a figure, maybe if, is the person happy? Is he in thought? Is he sad, melancholic? Um, so we, yes, definitely the way one works, or at least my, the way I work, is expressive. Mm -hmm. It's expressive more than, let's say, super realistic. So that's uh, kind of my genre of art mm -hmm. or my style of art. And what, what influences, do you have any that you can speak of? Um, I do like a lot of artwork. I mean, I do have to say I'm the kind of artist who's very open um, to different genres of art and I do have respect for all kinds of art. Um, so I do have respect for, let's say, sculpture. I do have respect for conceptual art. I do have respect for um, impressionistic art or Dutch like Vermeer style kind of art, um, even iconic art or icons. I do have to say, um, I do admire a lot of different genres of art. Um, the kind of art that I love to look at, I mean, I'm a big fan of um, the Impressionists, the French Impressionists, I'm sure a lot of people are too. Um, and I do like the German Expressionist. I do like uh, a lot of those artists too. The, um, and I do like also, um, a lot of modern day artists as well. So it's, it's not a specific, let's say, genre that I'm more gravitating towards. I do find beauty in everything, um, but definitely I love the French Impressionist. I do think that they are very good artists to look at, especially Claude Manet, uh, Renoir, um, and, um, and I do 
always tell my students to look at their work because what they did is very different than let's say all the other artists before them, how they viewed art, how they looked at, at nature. So for me, they're kind of essential in regards to let's say learning about art. Yeah, and I think that that's, uh, you know, uh, when I look at your work, you feel a, a very important uh, part of our, our program at the Yellow Barn. I think that uh, your ability to be creative and expressive and uh, strongly, uh, you know, when I see your work, how uh, the emotion plays such a significant part in what you're doing, that, uh, you know, that it's, it's something that I think, you know, sometimes students, they always t tend to think that it's the basics that you need to, to, to learn. But honestly, it's more than the basics. You have to become sensitive and personally sensitive. And, uh, and if you're not, it's like learning how to uh, read or write, a, write English. If you don't have anything to say, you're not emotional about what you're writing about, it, it shows. And I think that you have the ability to really bring that quality to your work. And I feel, um, you know, that's your strength from my point of view. Do you agree with that? I do agree. And actually, you bring up a wonderful point. And I'm glad that you uh, you notice it. Because I do, the way, let's say, I explain my artwork, I would say it's a form of visual poetry. So I do write poems. And, um, and I've been actually... Uh, brave enough to read lately my poems during receptions. And I've had people come to the receptions and ask and say, where's the poet? <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm a poet and an artist. So it's, it's, I'm happy to see that because I do feel that the artwork does, does become a form of visual poem. Um, so I do have to say, I'm definitely expressive in many art forms uh, as well. And I'm happy to see that uh, a painting becomes a bridge, a bridge to kind of, you know, translate that into the visual um, world for that matter. Yeah. So I think that that's, uh, for me, that, that this is important for our students to know, because when they are looking to be, uh, you know, themselves, you know, picking an instructor that really is sensitive to the way they think is important. Yes. And I think, you, you know, yeah. this is one of the things that you do well. So we're going to go to your work right now. Okay. And you, you, you sent me some work. And yeah. We'll talk a little bit about this. You should be seeing the PowerPoint right yes, now. Yes, I see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, the um, so I'm going to start with the first slide here, and uh, I'll let you just talk a little bit about yourself, your work, the the, the work you chose to submit here, and and why. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. Uh, you know, I'm sure students are are interested in how you work. So you know, the process and so on, all okay. right? Okay, uh, so basically what I gave you, um, I gave you basically um, uh, around 10 images and they're a repertoire of different things that I do. Uh, so uh, a, a good amount of images are what I've done or what we've done in class. So for the students interested in knowing more about the class, um, these are, for example, this painting right here, it's like a fall landscape. We did this in the fall session. Um, so I'm the type of instructor who, uh, I love nature. And I do think that nature, especially now, even more than before, plays a huge role in our life. Um, and um, so same thing like, let's say Claude Monet, uh, an observant of nature, a lover of nature. Um, so I basically take pictures when I go out on like, you know, to the parks or um, on an outing, I always take photos. So that's uh, something for me to just snap, you know, uh, photos and then come home and um, some photos I like. And, and I say, I, I want to share this with the students. So this one was based on a photo I took of uh, fall foliage. And I believe this one is around um, the Sugarloaf Mountain. So around the fall, uh, fall time when we have really beautiful fall season here in the DMV area. So, um, so, and this composition is, so basically this is the landscape. This is one of the compositions we do in class. So this is based on a photo that I sent to the students and I do a live demo of it during the Zoom class. So they would see a step-by-step -step approach uh, to basically what we're doing. So we start, for example, this is a full landscape. We all have the photos. So we work from a nice looking, you know, well crisp photo 
And then we start basically, I start usually with a drawing. So this is kind of the way you would want to do representational art with a very simple pencil drawing, okay? Um, so simple drawing that people, that it would be here, we have a tree, we have another tree, we have a fence in the background. We have a form of perspective. So when in this, in this example, it wouldn't be the first thing I would give the students. Uh, it would be like a, at a later class, the landscapes and the perspective kind of class. First, we start off with more simple subject matters such as still life, like uh, fruits and vegetables. Later on, we move on to landscapes. So for example, this is something I would start off with, um, or even one object with a drawing class, okay? So this is a drawing class. So this is made out of charcoal, but the way we do it, again, the same thing. Uh, for example, for the Zoom class, it's, I do a live demo. So I start from nothing, basically a white piece of paper, and we end up by the end of the class, by the end of the, the two hour class, we have a finished product. So everybody's happy and feels rewarded and feels that they accomplished something in class. So that's what I do in these classes. It's basically a step-by-step -step approach. So I would draw for the students, uh, for example, the creamer here, and then we would do a, a pencil drawing. So we don't start off with charcoal right away because charcoal is kind of difficult to erase. So we start off with a regular pencil drawing, like, um, and then we move on from that point to maybe uh, tweaking the drawing if it's, we do everything freehand, by the way. That's kind of the beauty of learning art. It's through learning, doing everything freehand. So you allow your own creativity and you also your sense of style to come through eventually. Um, so I draw, I, sh I show them how to draw, um, to be very truthful. So I always emphasize on how important it is to be very truthful to the subject matter. So for example, this bell pepper is kind of huge and the creamer is kind of small. So in a very sense, very weird sense that they're both kind of the same size, but the bell pepper was rather big. Uh, and the creamer, as I said, was small. So, but we were, were truthful to the fact that they were almost kind of the same size. Um, so that's something to be aware of, to be a good draftswoman and draftsman, a draftsperson, a good artist, you have to be very truthful to what, you, to what you're doing, to the subject matter, in this case, drawing. So we draw the lines. If they don't look good, I tell them to kind of fix it to the point that they look good. They resemble the bell pepper, they resemble the creamer. And then later on, we start with the shading. Here we use charcoal, which is a lot of fun. I love charcoal. I think charcoal is a wonderful medium. And charcoal has different, I mean, we have charcoal pencils. We work with also the charcoal sticks, uh, the willow charcoal sticks, which is a very natural medium, or the vine from the vine tree. Also the vine charcoal too, the soft vine charcoal. And we also soften it, we use a paper towel. So some things that you have even at home, you don't even have to go and buy things like the paper towels. Sometimes you also can use your hands, your fingers to kind of smudge things, um, even Q-tips. Um, so another point of being creative too, you know, kind of looking outside of the box and looking at what you have at home and playing around with it. Uh, but then we also pay attention to composition, obviously, to shadows, how everything that has weight casts a shadow. So kind of being aware of that, um, but also making sure that everything looks good not overworked and not underworked. So that's kind of where I step in and I guide the students and say, okay, don't overwork it because now you'll kill it. So it's one of those things where you have to be careful where you shouldn't overwork a composition or a painting or a drawing to the point that it becomes very stiff. So you have to know when to stop. And this one, obviously uh, for them, they still are learning. So I would tell them, please don't overwork it. Um, I like it the way it is, it looks good. So, um, and we do it, as I said, a step-by-step -step process uh, from nothing to a finished product within that short amount of time. So every time I pre present for them a project and, um, and I do try to make the projects interesting, but I also try to make the projects a little bit something they can relate to. So what you have at home as well too. So that's why I said a creamer, a bell pepper. Um, so in a, in a sense, I'm very much like Cezanne, kind of being aware of you have this at home work from that, you know? Um, so kind of letting your atmosphere, your ambiance, even what you eat, the fruits and the vegetables, um, the mugs and everything kind of become part of your art kind of portfolio, let's put it this way, and your subject matter and your inspiration. And that helps, it helps. In regards yeah. of shape, in regards of size, yeah. Let me ask you, that. this is your beginning drawing class here. Yes. And when you get these beginning students, um, 
there uh, are they have uh, they come to you with experience or what do you find uh, this um, you no i mean i think i think that for me i always tell the students uh, i do get fresh beginners um and I, I do get a lot of returning students as well who are intermediate and some of them have become quite advanced uh, but i do think so I show them step by step by step, but at the end, I mean, the students do end up with results that are very satisfactory. Um, and yes, this is for beginners, from beginners to intermediate. Uh, but I do believe that um, if you follow the steps and you just follow along what I say um, within class time, people will end up with very satisfying results. Um, and it's kind of like a constructing, you have to start with one thing, then another thing, and then another thing, and eventually, it's like a puzzle at the end everything in the picture looks good but yeah. you have to build it up uh, but, I, yeah i think that you're you're quite good at this i i really think whenever uh students are asking uh you know their their, their beginning students particularly asked me wh who to start with uh you're one of the ones that i really highly recommend because Thank i you. think that you're um you're very sensitive and sensitive to the student and uh, and the way the student sees and I think that this is one of the things that uh, you know is communicated uh, in your work as well. And uh, and you know, if anything, you know, somebody's looking for a, a very comfortable art class, you you make it that way. So Thanks. it's not like uh, it's not like something they can't master. You make sure that they they yeah. are successful with what they're doing. This next piece, speak about this one. So this one is basically also one of the kind of like beginning comp compositions. For this is also for, uh, this is not for drawing. This is for beginning and intermediate watercolor painting. So this is obviously a painting um, where we're using color, um, and um, again, it's very simple. Kind of like look around you. What do we have? Um, and I actually send them the photo of of the composition, and I, I I show them the actual thing. You know, the 3D object. You know, the banana, the peach, uh, or the nectarine. And basically, we we start off with. A composition, how you know uh, how to place uh, place the subject matter. Here, obviously, we have fruits, um, and this is basically a watercolor painting. So, again, we I start off with a very very simple drawing because we do need to have at least a sketch, um, but more like a contour sketch, not like filled in sketched a sketch with a shading. We don't need that for watercolor. For watercolor, we mainly need like a shape. So in this way, when I show the students this, for example, this, this, uh, the composition, I would say, think of it. So now Picasso becomes handy. We talked about Cezanne. Picasso becomes, becomes handy in a sense where Picasso was a cubist, where he saw shapes. And I do, do, I do tell the students that shapes are essential, essential in art. Um, so for example, if we're looking at the shapes, here we definitely have a circle right in the middle. We're not looking at it as a fruit or a vegetable. We're looking at it as shapes. So we definitely have in the middle a circle and behind it, we have like almost an arch or half a huge circle with a banana. Uh, so basically that really simplifies life uh, mm -hmm. for the students to kind of look at things as shapes, you know, and kind of like say, what does it look, so, uh, look like? Uh, for example, it looks like a shape, you know, it looks like, a, like more of a curvy shape, mm -hmm. but these shapes are considered organic shapes, meaning they are uh, nature made. Um, shapes. So if I don't usually put something difficult like a chair would be man-made, too difficult, you know, uh, maybe for a later class, but not the first class. Right. So we start off with very simple shapes. And from that point, and I don't want to make some painting sound really, really simple, we color in. <laughs> but in a way, sometimes it is It's really all about just making shapes and coloring in within the shapes, especially when we're doing still life. Um, and I keep it simple. I don't want to overcomplicate it with so much stuff in the background or the foreground. Keeping it simple for the students, uh, two or sometimes even one, starting with one subject matter. Let's say we start off with one peach, and then the next class would be adding another fruit, a peach and a banana, or something else, um, or an apple and a banana, or something else. Uh, so we do. I do start them step by step, but that eventually they will they will become very very good at the end. But we do kind of do a step by step process that is easy for them to kind of understand shape, but also we move on to coloring as well. So um, we, I show them how to mix colors, which is a lot of fun. And I do tell them that in a way, when you start mixing colors, you become a chemist. So science is involved in art. Um, so certain colors, you mix them together, 
you get a certain effect. So I do show them how to make the color wheel. I do show them how to mix the colors because I do think in a painting class, you have to kind of, the students have to in a way also understand and know how to eventually get to the point of making colors out of, let's say colors they, they see in the photo or they see in nature, but they don't really have it in their tubes. And most of the colors that are in nature are rarely, rarely found in a tube. So you have to be, you have to know how to mix colors to get to really brilliant colors. Um, so that's something that I teach them also. It's very essential how, so color theory, understanding co colors, um, the mixture of colors, uh, and then also uh, the play on like foreground, background composition, that's also essential in making a painting skilled and also successful. Yeah, and you know, when you, um are working with these beginning students. I mean, you're the kind of teacher that doesn't overwhelm them, uh, you know, with higher expectations. You really take them step by step, and you're sensitive yeah. to where they are at the at the time that they're working. And I think that that's one of the uh, most important things. Let me ask you a question: When those students are done with, uh, or when you're teaching them, what is it that you think? Um, what do you feel is important in the work of your students? What, how, what do you uh, want them to understand? Is it personal? What, what is it, do you think? So for me, what I like to see is growth. So I want to see them grow. But mm -hmm. and when uh, obviously the more they do, the better they become. And the more practice they, you know, more practice, the more work they do, they will become better. So that's just part of kind of growth also. Um, so I do want them to grow, obviously, I, as a teacher, I would like them to see their artistic growth within my class, and I do see that. I also want, want to see, uh, and I see it as well, uh, for them to explore. So, so to have this kind of entering into an, almost like an art adventure or journey and being explorative uh, about um, the colors and the medium and the subject matter and the themes and what does this make, you know, how, what, how, let's say, how can watercolor, why is it so different, let's say, than other mediums, what it can do for me, or let's say charcoal or ink. Um, so all that stuff, um, kind of keeping that in mind, how can this medium be different or how, what it can offer me, but also the themes as well. So kind of being explorative, being open-minded, being open-minded to different techniques, um, and the play of color and what happens. So, so for example, with watercolor, sometimes I just make them uh, freehand, like tell them work from imagination where they're just mixing colors here and there and seeing it merge together. And a lot of times they end up doing really pretty paintings from their own imagination. So I do want them to also explore their imagination. But, oh, and this helps as well in opening up their creativity and opening up themselves also and allowing their creativity, which everybody has creativity, sometimes it's hidden, you know, or undiscovered most of the time, okay? So, and that kind of opens up. So having different themes, different subject matters, different projects, how we, uh, how we uh, approach them, but also in general, I want them to have the enthusiasm and the drive and the love for art. So that's kind of the only thing I ask for in a student. I want them to have the love for art in general, and the drive and the enthusiasm um, to, to learn, basically, yeah. When you have a student who comes to you and says, I can't do it. Or, I say you can't. <laughs> or, or I can't, this, what I do, it, it, I'm just not good at it. What do you do with it? So what I, yeah, so basically I, I, what I do is I, I will usually sit with them and I, I tell them, no, you can't. Um, uh, and I think in my class, in a way I feel, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's me, as you said, and maybe I've, it kind of like as a contagious thing. I feel like people feel their, you know, their possibilities. Mm -hmm. And so they are, they're opening up their creativity and they want to explore their, their own possibilities of what they can bring forth. Um, so, but if I have a student who, let's say, says, I can do it, usually I sit with them, I kind of show them, but maybe I let them do it after me. And, I, and then I might say, let's see, do a little bit more and do a little bit more. So it's a little bit like uh, kind of a, um, almost like um, I would say careful attention to that student, but also kind of um, 
in a way, it's a little bit like nurturing as well, um, and and seeing growth that way as well. But it it has uh, encouragement. I would say encouragement is very essential. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, I do show them. I do a lot of times show them. Okay, now let me show you. For example, people would say, I would show them something wrong. I would say, Does this look like? Like let's say I make a, the letter Z a couple of times, and I say, Does this look like a circle? They would laugh and say, No, that doesn't look like a circle. Then I would make maybe curly hair and I would say, does this look like a peach? They would say, no, that doesn't look like a peach. Or I would, I would I make a star. I would say, does this look like, for example, a peach or a banana? They would laugh and I say, okay, now I make a half smiley. Is it getting closer? And they're like, oh yeah, okay. So sometimes it's how you teach. Sometimes it's, and then this way they will know, for example, if I make a zigzag that or that doesn't look like a peach, it would not represent a peach, for example, you know? So uh, this way kind of, I show them maybe what not to do. <laughs> and then they will say, okay, uh, uh, they'll learn what to do. But yeah, I do have maybe very interesting ways of approaching subject matters to simplify it for the students, but also to make it very accessible for them to learn as well. Yeah. yeah, and to and to be excited about it. Yeah, you know, right. I think that's the the key, and you do that well too, by the way. So that's that's yeah. one of the things. So now we're getting the, into this is another one landscape. of your landscapes. Okay. So now I wouldn't give them the landscape right away because the landscape basically. So have you noticed um, with the still lifes, everything is within the shape. So when we make shapes, as I said before, we do a circle, we do a triangle. It depends on the shapes what we're doing. Um, um, everything is kind of in a way it's still life you draw something and you color kind of within the, within it so maybe it's a little bit easier in that sense but it's a different genre of art for that matter now we move on into a little bit more open space so basically looking uh this is based on nature based, based on a photo i took of the lake uh, of a lake actually in the seneca creek state park uh, so i base a lot of things also on like our environment you know so a lot of people relate i say oh have you have you been to this place have you been to those? Oh yeah, I've been to, for example, the lake at Seneca Creek State Park uh, or maybe somewhere else. But so people can also relate to it and know what I'm talking about. Um, so this is based on a lake, but it could also be any lake for that matter. Um, and um, with this, we enter, uh, I've given them other subject matters where we've done landscapes. So landscapes are essential in art. I love landscape art. Personally, I, I think that has to do with the fact that I'm a nature lover. So I, in general, I just love different terrains, <laughs> geography. I also love geography. So I do try to bring that as well into the class. Um, but we enter a little bit of a, I wouldn't say it's more difficult, but it's just a little bit uh, more work in that sense, because we're dealing again with geography. We have mountains, we have water. Uh, we have here actually a fence and something concrete, like almost uh, a concrete fence looking into the landscape. We also have fluffy clouds, we have a sky. So we're now entering a little bit more work in the sense where we're working with different elements, um, such as water, but also we're, so one has to be a little bit, again, as you said, the word sensitive to the composition and to the different making of all these different compositions. Um, so basically in this example, also I teach them a sense of perspective. So I do teach them perspective a lot. Perspective is essential um, in learning um, landscapes, um, also cityscapes as well. So basically <clears throat> outside painting, you have to have a little bit of an understanding, like here's the horizon line, that's the sky, and this is the earth, you know, the, the separation point there, um, and all that things to kind of, number one, to make a decent looking drawing, and from that point, building on the painting. So in this example, actually we use masking fluid. For this. So this was a project to show them how to use masking fluid, which basically is kind of preserves the white of the paper, which makes things very nice. And um, so, so in a way, it's it's a way to kind of preserve the whites of the paper, so you don't over color the areas where you have to have the reflection or the luminous effect in the painting or the clouds. So it's a way to be to be a little bit more careful. So as I said, in watercolor, there are techniques. Um, there are things that can help us in making the painting more effective. So, and masking fluid is one of them. So I, this was a project of learning how to work with masking fluid, what to, you know, mask fluid, and eventually we, you, you take it off and you might have to add, let's say, some gray in the clouds, maybe fill in a little bit of um, like a 
ripples in the water. Um, so the, it's, 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 we still do a lot of work, um, um, but, but also it was kind of um, introducing one thing. So I tried to kind of introduce the different things that one can do within watercolor, besides just kind of using brushes and paint and water. Yeah. yeah. That, the, you know, this, this is one of the things that they're going to get from you, which I think is a lot about learning about materials, especially right. paint. Because you, th this is what, when you first touched on it, th this is what your work is all about. It's about how you handle paint. So the next piece here, which is, I think, one of the, if, you know, I've, I've known your work. This is definitely one of the most powerful pieces. You know, it, it etches itself in your your mind. Uh, speak a little bit about this, because this is, this is the expressionistic side right. that I think speaks of how th this, your sensitivity. Right. So basically within the repertoire of uh, the different images that I gave you, I also gave you some of my milestone or signature pieces, basically. Uh, this painting I did a long time ago. So um, as I said, I went to the Corcoran College of Art and Design and um, I, I uh, loved very much going there. I had a lot of studio time. But when I was there, a lot of my friends, uh, other fellow art students were modeling for me, okay? So um, my friends were modeling for me and uh, basically my thesis show was about my, my friends. <laughs> but I did it in a very expressionistic abstract way. I didn't wanna make it realistic because again, the emphasis was on, on the mood, uh, on the feelings, on the emotions. Uh, it wasn't based on, I wanna just make a realistic replica of, uh, of someone's portrait, okay? So it was more about transcending a little bit, again, pushing the figure a little bit more into, into almost like a psychological state for that matter. Uh, so for a very long time, I did the figure. I worked figuratively. Primarily, I'm a figurative artist, so, uh, and I do love working with a figure. I love anatomy. Um, I think it has to do with the fact that I do love science too. So that kind of, um, and I do approach art in a very scientific way as well. Um, so, so I've done a lot of figurative artwork for many, many years. Um, and this is one of them. And interestingly, everybody who sees this painting wants to buy it. Everybody loves this painting. I've got so many offers for this painting. And um, this painting has been printed. Um, uh, I'm a licensed artist too. So it's, it's, it's people somehow, I don't know what it is. I think it's just the look, it's the grab with the eyes it pulls people through, it, it speaks to people. And I think for me, that's essential that art, my art can speak to people on its own. And I think this painting does it really effectively. So this is one of my paintings that I'm not selling, that I don't sell, uh, but, uh, but I do uh, love it very much. And it, uh, I find it to be, I guess, one of those milestone paintings, you know, in my lifetime, yeah. So this is one of the things that you, you touched on when you talk in terms of psychology or the psychology behind a piece of work, all right, this is where I get, when I look at your work, this is what your work speaks to me about. For some people who are more realistic, they're, they're gonna be descriptive and they're gonna be talking, you know, their, their work speaks of what we're looking at. Yeah. But this goes deeper than that. It's, it's, a, mm -hmm. um, it's a level of understanding that, uh, you know, I think all artwork has, an element of psychology in it, okay. you know, uh, the, the, or psychological aspects in it. Let's put it that way. Yeah. The um, and this piece, you feel profoundly. You 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 do that with the the interaction of the viewer to the to the piece, and and you know it's a powerful piece in a lot of a lot of different ways. Scale the scale relationship yeah. is what it's a big piece. Yeah, it's a big it's a big piece, and I would say that it's almost human size. Yeah. So, uh, when you see it in reality, you, you do feel that, uh, I mean, people, I've had it in exhibits where people will stand there for a very, very, very long time, just quiet, staring at it. Yeah. It really speaks to people or people come in and say, I want to buy this right away. I want that painting. And I'm like, okay, no, <laughs> but it's, it's just one of those, it, it is a painting that I do feel there's something about it that grabs the viewer, and I'm I'm very happy that that it 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 does create those feelings. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and I think for anybody who's who's wanting to study with you, that's one of the things that I think you convey to them. 
I really think that, uh, you know, uh, and I think that's an important part of being creative. There's a difference between just being a student and being an artist. And artists are the ones who really speak from their hearts. And, you know, and I think you have that, uh, that ability to, tra you know, transmit that to your students. This mm -hmm. next piece, now, you, now we're going into some, what we would call non-objective painting, essentially. Exactly. So for, I would say the latest couple of years, I've been doing a lot of uh, um, non-objective or non-representational artwork, or let's put it this way, abstract artwork. Um, and it's, uh, again, though, most of my abstracts, obviously, uh, it, it has to do a lot of with imagination and creativity. And that's why I personally like to do abstracts, because it allows my mind to become free. It, it does allow kind of like that, that subconscious to come through. Um, and, I, uh, and I've done actually, if you looked at the figure before, if you saw the background, the background was rather abstract. The figure in a way was abstract in here and there as well. You see, so the background, so, and this one was done back in the nineties. so a long time ago. So even back in art school, I've done a lot of things abstractly. So in the sense, I would say I've, I've always been an abstract artist or I've abstracted a lot of things uh, in that sense. But this one, I, I, I kind of like went from, I don't want to do the figure anymore. I want it to be non-objective. Um, so it doesn't have to represent something. It re represents, let's say, colors. Or it re one can say it represents a rainy day as well. Um, but, in a, but also with the abstracts, they're also based for, on my love for nature. So in a sense, I do not really uh, stray away that much from nature, for that matter. Uh, for me, nature is the biggest artist or the biggest teacher for art, um, or for everything. Nature is the biggest teacher. Uh, so I do think, in a sense, this was kind of like an inspiration from a rainy day that was overcast, uh, but then with a strong yellow line. And this is called the yellow line. I also one of those paintings that also got a lot of success. Um, and I did this in 2017, it's been exhibited. Um, and, um, and also people react really nicely to this painting, although it's non-objective, non-representational, but they do really uh, love it. And I feel like as a composition, it works very well as well. So you, uh, it's one of my you, favorites. Uh, do you feel um, that, you know, when you talk in terms of, the, uh, of abstraction, yeah. uh, do you feel that that's closer to your personality? Um, in a way, it is. I, I feel it is um, because I'm, as I said before, I do write poetry and sometimes I want just a couple of words to give you a, a certain sense or a certain emotion or a certain feeling or kind of, as you said before, um, with the other painting, there's a certain mystery. And I do like, at least for my art, to be kind of like that. I don't want it to be so clear and, cle you know, so, obvi so obvious. I want it to be more behind, there's more to it behind the surface, let's put it this way, or there's a deeper meaning, or there's something more to it than um, what you see. So yes, in a sense, I do think of it as more thought provoking, but kind of, again, it's, it's a, for me, it's a cognitive experience as well, uh, that I, we all possess, it just, just kind of pushes you more to areas, maybe, I say, certain parts of the brain where the cobwebs are, you know, that to, at least for me when I paint, that I want to kind of discover more. Um, so I do think to get, at least for me, if non-objective will help me reach that part of the brain or part of the subconscious to make that, to make it come through uh, to my artwork. Um, mm -hmm. So I do feel, and I've said this before in exhibits, when I paint, I feel like it's almost like another spirit is within me kind of creating the artwork. And I'm kind of like almost the vehicle. <laughs> that transcends the information into onto the canvas. I know it sounds, it sounds very sci-fi, but it, it, in a way it kind of enters a little bit that world of uh, almost, uh, un, un, we understand it, but at the same time, the subconscious does its own thing. And I think that's why I love kind of non-representational because it gives me one, it kind of brings me closer to just, let me create a certain likeness of something. Mm -hmm. uh, although I do tell the people, and especially the students to get to this point. I mean, I've been doing art for, as I said, ever since I was born. Um, you have to know how to draw. You have to understand colors. You have to know color theory. You have to, you cannot take shortcuts to get to this point. You have to do all those steps 
and all that work, and maybe even all those years to even get to abstraction because abstraction seems like it could be easy, but it actually requires a lot of thought um, and in, in regards to balance and composition and colors and all this stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I think that what, what we're seeing with this interview is we're seeing someone who can really teach the basics to their students, but yet at the same time, you know, uh, you, you see the, the depth of your understanding and how you express your, your feelings through your work. And, um, you know, it's powerful work, definitely. Powerful because of its contrast, powerful because of the color palette, uh, the surface, you know, there are a lot of elements that express, uh, you know, a, an idea other than just its literalness. So I think that you, you, you touch on that. The, the next piece. Yeah, this is called Overseas. It's actually a new piece. I did this in 2020 in, during quarantine, during COVID times. So this is a new piece. And this was in, a, in an exhibit, in a solo exhibit I had in September, uh, which was very well received um, and well, you know, written about. And people love this painting so much. And th when I did this painting, I was intending for, again, an abstract composition, um, but also I was thinking of boats and water. Um, and maybe distant lands in the background. So kind of having at least what that's what I'm thinking. Maybe people see it and they say, oh, I see two rocks or so for, you know, in, in a sense, and I'm the type of artist who, who loves when people kind of give room for interpretation and imagination when looking upon my work and looking at my work. I do want the people to say, oh, I see this or I see that. And I kind of create a conversation uh, on the, you know, about the piece. And I do welcome that very much in, 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 in art and looking at art. Um, so for me, it's called Overseas because I did this painting as again, you know, in, in <laughs> during quarantine, stuck at home. Uh, I, I did a lot of paintings for this, for the exhibit, for the upcoming solo exhibit. And, and, and most of the work was kind of like how I feel, like the vacations that I can't go to, uh, the distant lands that I've traveled to that I don't cannot travel to at the moment. Um, and it, because when Corona came and COVID came, it's really, I'm, of course, everybody's like plans or summer plans or trips were ruined. Uh, and for that matter, uh, a lot of things change, obviously. Our lives have changed so much. So this painting is kind of reflective or almost reminiscent and nostalgic of a time that we had that's passed in the past, but 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 not such a long time ago. We, do, we, we had it, let's say, a, a year ago or something. So it's kind of looking back at, that's why it's called overseas. So I'm kind of looking at maybe things that I've done in the past, the, tra the trips and the travels. And I do love water, so I try to bring that, uh, the element of water in my paintings a lot. So, I, and I, blue is my favorite color. I think people can tell that blue is my favorite color. So I do bring that color, obviously. Um, and I do love skyscapes as well. So I do bring that to, to the audience. Um, so in a way, the painting becomes almost like um, kind of a nostalgic take Again, it's a form of visual poetry, a nostalgic take of and being reminiscent of time that was fun, you know, adventurous, uh, but kind of we don't really have it anymore. So a reflective painting for that matter. What's what's interesting is um, when I look at your color work, I see Goethe's color theory. And I don't know if you're how familiar you are with Goethe's work. You know, with color theory, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, he he went on to influence Turner and uh, you oh. know, I mean, huh? all, all the all the German expressionists. I mean, the okay. the nature of it is uh, um, the highly emotional color. So oh, when okay. Newton was working with the properties of light, as far uh -huh. as color is concerned, Goethe yeah. was working with the psychological aspects. And yeah. the interesting thing about the, the black was that it was um, what he said about blue was that blue is black made visible. Oh, that, was his, wow. that was his take on things. So yeah. we're talking 18, 1810. Okay. What, what we're talking about. And, you know, your work has a lot of that in it. So I'm not familiar with it to look him up, but okay, um, well, yeah. I think um, the, um, the emotion that you're, again, that you're bringing to this. And I could feel a dimension 
in this painting that felt like water. All right. And I think that's the key. It's not just looking at something, but it's feeling it, which I think is where you, you are with your work. And yeah. so um, here's another piece. So this is another piece that was on exhibit this past summer in New York City at Lichten Fire, which is a gallery that represents my work in Manhattan. And um, the theme of the uh, exhibit was When Night Falls. So basically, uh, again, all these paintings look much better in reality, obviously, in person. Uh, but this painting is about, basically, we have just the leftover of the sun, the reflection of the sun. Again, we do have the elements of water. But the water has gotten much darker because now we are moving into the darkness, into the night. But I didn't want, as you said before, I do love light. So for me, elements of light, um, space, um, and as you, as I said, water, elements of water, kind of like very, very interesting for me. And I do think I revisit these kind of um, themes over and over again because I just love them and I like like them to be part of my. Uh, paintings. So with this one, I'm giving the impression again, the impression of the sun has fallen over certain surfaces. So we do see like the leftover or what's left of the day through the colors, through that peach kind of light, mm -hmm. but it is turning into night. So we have kind of kind of entering into a different light, which is darker uh, the nighttime. And the nighttime skies, obviously, and the water reflection. So this one has to do with, again, the theme of reflection. But the other one was more psychological reflection of how I felt. Uh, but this one is more reflective of what happens when light reflects on, let's say, darker objects or darker matter. Um, and um, so different colors, but also how it changes, how color changes, and how sometimes we still see the flickers of light, basically, the flickers of the end of the day uh, reflecting on water. And some parts of the water would be still very twinkling, uh, very luminous. So kind of trying to create that aspect. So I didn't want to just make one dark painting and say, that's night, a nighttime painting. I wanted it to be more interesting, but also a little bit more poetic as well. Mm -hmm. um, so this one's called Night Approaching. And it's interesting that you, you mentioned poetry and how important poetry is. You know, because it, 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 poetry is the abstract use of words, and you you and here you're doing the same thing with paint, and I think they they work together. Okay, so this piece. So this piece is called Spectrum. Um, so when I made this piece, also I made this. It's a it's a recent piece as well. So this one is done during COVID. So all these like three pieces that I you just showed uh, overseas, night approaching and spectrum I have all been done during quarantine, you know, so during <laughs> quarantine, during COVID. So I feel in a sense, um, there's emotion, different emotions because we're living under a different kind of reality and we are all feeling it. Um, so with this one, I've had a lot of, actually I had very bad ear infection when I created this painting. Um, and I don't know if it shows kind of like the pain <laughs> That you're, but I do think in a very bizarre way, uh, the paintings that I did during the time I had that ear infection, which was extremely painful, were very beautiful and very interesting and very, very strong. So I said I had a lot of pain, but the outcome was really good. Um, so in a sense, as I kind of, kind of like kid about it. And sometimes I say, pain creates painting. <laughs> so it's a very funny kind of play on words, but um, but in a way, uh, again, that kind of aspect of it. So this one is very abstract. This one also was in the Washington Post and a lot of press love this painting. So they always show this painting. It's been in many, many recent press. Mm -hmm. um, so it's called Spectrum. First, I wanted to call it Rainbow, but then I was thinking, I kind of wanted it to be a different arrays and different hues and tones of, of, of different things. It, it, it's abstract, obviously, but it also is meant to represent a sunset or parts of a sunset, which I love. Again, I love elements of light. So for me, the sun is very essential. The moon is very essential. Um, the reflective, and that's why I love Monet too, because Monet paid so much attention to light, to natural light, and how natural light reflects on different textures and different objects. And depending on the object, it looks different. 
Um, so that's why I feel like Monet would be my kind of kindred spirit uh, um, kind of artist um, that I relate to. Um, so basically, again, I'm bringing my favorite colors, which are the colors blue. I do like strong colors as well, but I also wanted with this one to have light and dark and the play of light and dark, but also the element of movement, which is very essential in art. I mean, we talk about, and I do tell the students, we have movement, we have contrast, we have line. Um, so we have shapes. We talked about shapes with a still life. Um, and so those things are very essential in making, in general, a painting or a composition better or successful for that matter, kind of keeping these things in mind. Even if it's an abstract piece, even if it's a non-representational one, I mean, as a professional, I know that these are very essential elements to an art piece, um, to make pretty much any art piece successful for that matter, or composition better. Uh, so one has to kind of being, be aware of those elements, but how they play together and how they interact. But at the same time, when I paint, I really go for it. And I do think that people can see that. There's that, again, I love painting. I love to be very painterly. So I do think that that comes through very well. Uh, people can see that easily, that I do like very strong brush strokes and very strong kind of like take on um, the painterly uh, quality of the artwork. Yeah, and if I, I gave you a word, I'd say you're courageous. Yeah, I would say right. <laughs> I'm pretty courageous with paint. That's you're courageous with paint. And you're, <laughs> yeah. you, know, you see it as a language. And, uh, and, you know, I always say to students when they ask me why a, an award, why they received an award, I say the knowledge is in the paint. No, oh, that's nice. Yeah. yeah. So I think that that's one of the most important parts. Yeah. So with that, um, we're just about done. I think God, okay. people really got to know you. All right. I think that this is what's sure really is, great yeah. about this this interview. Um, if there's anything that you could say to your anyone who's going to take a class to you, any advice? Um, what, what, before we do that, that you're, you're, we've gone to virtual teaching now. And I don't know how you have found it, but for me, I have more students now than I've ever had. And, and it's interesting because I think yeah. the um, uh, it's a format that, uh, you know, for different audiences, for sure. But it also gives people who are not living nearby the opportunity to take yeah. classes with True. them. It's very right. true. That, yeah, I've had students from out of town, from Boston, yeah. um, from Georgia, from different, from Savannah. From, I mean, the, and they're returning. And that's the, you know, that's a wonderful thing. And then they tell their friends or their family members and they join again. And, and I do think it's a way to connect. So it's definitely, the studio obviously has its charm, you know, but, but this is, one has to be, I tell the students as well, uh, you know, which, I mean, we live in a changing world, right? Yeah, yeah. And, um, and one has to be adaptive. Yeah, sort of I, think, I think we, you know? we both learned. I know yeah. working with you in the last uh, three or four months with the the way we're handling these classes and how you've mastered it, that it, it's working for you. So what advice, uh, anything that, to, to end with as far as talking to a student, what would you say to them? So the most important thing is, is you know, to, to be open up to different, to explore. And as you said before, you said, when you look at my artwork, you see that I'm courageous. So a lot of times I tell the students to be brave, you know, just go for it, you know, or, you know, be open-minded and see what it does. You know, you, you would learn, maybe you learn that you would like to paint fruits more than landscapes, or you like to watercolor or this specific medium more than others. So kind of just being be open-minded about you know, but also I think it, it is very good for them to explore, to, to, and eventually the most essential thing in my opinion is they will see that the inner creativity within them will come out. And, and that's kind of the most rewarding. What I see that my students always say, you opened my eyes. You opened my eyes. Like I would, they would say, I'm driving and I'm looking at the moon. And then I think about you and I think about the class and I would never look at the moon usually but now because I've taken your class, I look at the moon differently. Right. I, I'm trying to go home and try to paint the moon with the way I saw it or the way the colors of the moon or the clouds around the moon. So in a way, I do think an art class opens one's eyes to 
not only necessarily just how we draw something, but also to what your ambiance, your, your surrounding nature, you know? And that's kind of like, again, you know, opening the eyes, but op also opening your creativity as well. Yeah, well, that, that worked out really well. And I, I want to thank you so much for, um, you know, uh, doing this uh, interview, because I think that it's going to re be very, very beneficial to everyone. So with that, I'm going to say good night to you. Good night. Okay.